you were here for, for what I said. I said. Welcome. Welcome. Today's, Today's sermon, sermon, simple title. title. What, what is, is the battle? battle? What, what is, is the battle? battle? We will be in the book of Acts. Um, I struggled this week early because of one passage that has always been a burden within, inside the charismatic church, and you'll hear it hopefully when we read scripture. We're starting in Acts 14. Verse 8. In Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, crippled from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking, Paul observing him intently, seeing that he had faith to be healed. Said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet, and he leaped and walked. Now when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in Lysonian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas, they called Zeus, and Paul, Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in the front of their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. But when the apostle Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in, the, in among the multitude, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We're also men with the same nature as you. Preach to you that you should not turn you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made heaven and the earth to see and all things in them who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their ways nevertheless he did not leave himself without witness in that he was good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons filling our hearts with food and gladness and with those sayings they could Scarcely restrain the multitude from sacrificing to them. We'll stop there. I'm not going to go into 1920 yet. Interesting. In my journey with the Lord, and watching and hungry for the word, and watching different persuasions of the Christian faith, that word faith has been a struggling word for me, not in a bad way for me, but watching how it has been used against people who may not have faith in other people's opinions. And so with that, in my early journey, I was going to a church that didn't really pray for the sick and didn't do those things. And I was watching a man on TV and he would say, you know, you just have faith and you'll be healed. And that's true. But what does that really mean? How does that really work? And so what began to happen in my heart is how does this all function? How does it really function for you and me to have faith so you might be healed? Okay, because I'm looking at people I know that need healing right now, okay? All right? And, and I, I want you healed. And we've seen healing. So why does it work or not work? Well, all those questions have always wrestled. So when I got to this passage, I'm going to myself, I'm going, well, you know, it'd be really easy to skip 8, 9, and 10. We'll just skip the tough part and go into the things about Zeus and all of that, and we'll just, but you can't do that in the Word of God. You have to take it in. And so that word faith in the Greek is pistios. It's a conviction, a confidence, a trust, a belief, a reliance, trustworthiness, and a persuasion. So, there's a lot to that word of faith. Now, when you look at Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10, it says you have to have faith to believe and you get saved. And it says with your whole heart, okay, that he died and rose again. And if you believe in that, you're saved and you have eternal life. That's a very big thing to have faith and believe. Because in that interaction, you could put believe or faith. Because it's the same word. 
And so I'm going, okay, how do I put this? Because when someone doesn't get healed, they get offended, not usually by God, but by people around them saying, well, you know, if you had faith. I've seen it used so many times, it makes me very angry. When someone is not healed, when they're prayed over, man tries to come up with a reason why, and they, they blame God or they blame the person. But they don't understand the fullness that you have to understand. We are in the kingdom of God when you get saved. And as you're saved, you're in the kingdom. And so we have this idea that everything that is going to be given to us in eternity is now. And it's not. It's a part of now. So it would be really nice that everything we ever believe in, everything we have to do is everyone be healed. But the fullness of the glory does not come until the resurrection of the dead and Jesus comes and establishes his kingdom and there'll be no more sickness, death, or tears, or any of those things. So why does God do what he does and how does he work it? I don't know because I, I want to give you a clue. I'm not God. <laughs> But I'm supposed to walk in faith and pray for people, and I've seen some mighty miracles in my life. I first got brought into that back in the, I think, 1988, 89, baby in the Lord. I mean, a baby in the Lord. Didn't know how baby I was, because, you know, you don't know it until you get a little more mature. And so I'm on a Wednesday night service, and this church I was in was, and I'll use this word, experimenting with working of the Spirit. So they, they didn't quite, you know, they were trying to bring everyone into it without confronting doctrine and just a little bit. And it was a Wednesday night service, and we did our worship, and we were going to pray for people if they needed prayer. And I remember a woman sitting, I didn't know her at the time, and she came up to me and said, I want you to pray for this young man. And this is how she put it. The Lord told me that you were to pray for this young boy. Now, I'm a baby. I didn't understand, first of all, how the heck, who she was, or any of those things. But I remember when that little 15-year-old boy was coming in, he was walking like this. Okay? And so we, I grabbed the boy with another brother, a couple other brothers, and we took him over, put him in the chair. Well, he had one leg that was clinically four inches shorter than the other. And I'm going to look at a carpenter here. Is that about four inches? Is that about four inches? Okay. That's short, people. So I'm sitting there. Now realize I didn't have faith. How do I know that? Because when the woman said, God told me that you were to pray for him, I turned to an older brother in the Lord and I said, Ed, you pray for him. And we had taught, you know, put the person in your eye and you see the difference and da-da-da, right? So Ed's praying for him. And you could see the leg just shaking but not doing nothing. Now, I want you to understand. The Lord told a woman to tell me. Well, I'm a baby. I don't understand that stuff. So Ed goes, well, why don't you pray, John? I go, okay. And I didn't know. I just got down and, and because sometimes I find out that the Spirit of God is working in me and I don't even know why I'm saying what I'm saying. So I grabbed that leg and said, in the name of Jesus, devil, let go of that leg and come out. It come flying out like you can't believe. He's screaming because bone is being added to his leg. He jumps up, looks at his leg, and he goes, my knees are even. I'm jumping, doing backflips, I'm on fire, I'm dreaming hallelujah, okay? I, you know, right away, human, I must have a healing ministry. I'm going to be a preaching, and then the healings are going to come, and, okay? I'm going to be definitely a total Pentecostal preacher when I didn't even know what Pentecostal was yet. That's the devil. But why don't you listen? God spoke to a woman, and then I find out he was in a group home 
with this lady and her family, I mean, in a business she was in, and that his family, his mom had died and he was being raised in a satanic coven. I didn't know it. But out of my mouth flew devil. Get off of him. Leg grow. Well, I have to admit, it wasn't like I had some biblical understanding or I, you know, I was full of wisdom. No, it was just the Spirit of God coming upon me for the moment for that boy. Because that boy was talking to his mother, which he thought was his mother, which it wasn't. It was a critter because she was dead. A week later or so, her, his dad stole him from the group home and took him back to Michigan to the coven. Now think of what God was doing. It wasn't about the leg being healed. It was about that boy knowing there was a God in heaven who loved him and cared about him, and that God was greater than the devil that he was being raised in. I didn't know any of that. None. But you ready for this? God did. God knew it all. So God chose for that moment to do something for the purpose of the glorification of his son that he might know that boy might find salvation. Now they found him, brought him back, and he, was, uh, he loved God. So, but understand, I prayed for people for a year after that, and nobody got healed. What are you doing, God? Why would you give me that experience and not see any healings? Because it's not about man, it's about God. It's not about what you think you know, or how much you know of God. It's about the God you need to know. So you're looking at two men named Paul and Barnabas who've had personal experiences with the power of God. They knew God. And they preached Jesus. Okay? And so their faith was circled around that. And what I want for us to have today is to go, what is the battle? The battle is between gods. And you don't know it half the time. Not to pick on you guys, but most of you, you're in a cloud. You don't even know how much demonic activity is coming against your walk, how much crap is coming against you. Oh, I'll have to get that edited out. And anyway... Okay? And so what I'm trying to teach you is there's something about God that we need to understand and grip today because he's maker of heaven and earth. Remember he said so? He, he talked about that. So Paul's telling those guys who are falling after Zeus, oh no, this God, my God, he made the seas. He made everything. He's creator of everything. He, he brings the rain. He brings all the food. Everything is about the God in heaven. Everything. I love the Christmas season, but I hate, I'm going to say it, I hate the Christmas season of commercialism that leaves out. And we fight as Christians with the world, but I just, they just need to say, Merry Christmas. No, they don't. They don't believe it. Why do you want them to say it? We want them to believe what we believe, right? Yeah, we do. But it ain't Merry Christmas to them. It's just Happy Holidays. So we got this stupid fight over that in the, in the natural when they don't believe in God. Why you want... They, they, they would rather worship Zeus. Or they might worship a tree. Or they might worship all kinds of things. We're living in a season where we're going to be called to know what we know and stand what we believe and not back up from it. And we're going to know how to do it in love and the power of God. Terry, could you put up chapter 3 of Acts, please? Fixing his eyes on him, with John and Peter said, look at us. He gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. He took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle and bones received strength. 
So he leaped up, stood, walked, and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. Amen. Amen. Very similar to just what happened with Paul and Barnabas. But what was going on? The man was looking for a handout, and Jesus gave him a hand up. And they said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, now receive. Now, we got a lot of things to talk about in heaven when we get there. And I'm going to go, hey, Peter, was it a word of knowledge? Did you hear something from the Holy Spirit? That you, you know? Or was it just faith that Peter had in Jesus Christ? Just a personal revelation that he had with Jesus. That he met him in a way that he just knew him in a way that he could speak it. And the man was raised. It's that simple. And we go, well, I want to do that. But see, how did Peter know Jesus? How did Peter walk with Jesus? Paul, with Saul at the time, walking down Damascus, was out to kill Jews and Christians. But then it says, after he got saved, for three years he disappeared into the desert. Three years! And in Arabia, and many believe he went to the mountain of God, where Moses was at that time. And sat down with God, and he had to get everything in his mind that was all about the law, and find out about the grace and the purpose of Christ in such a way that he could believe in the Messiah, and then walk in great faith. See, God did something for me when healing that boy, but it wasn't. It wasn't what um, others might think. It was God getting my attention that if someone, if God speaks, he's going to do it. I didn't know that. If God speaks, he's going to do it. You know why? He's God. So... I'm wrapped up here. What do we do with this? There's people here that need healing. Physical healing. Okay? Emotional healing. Why doesn't God just do it all the time? Why don't we give God all the time? So God took me away from healing and brought me to a revelation that you may not really grip yet. I had someone tell me the other day that when they first started coming here, a while back, before they first became steady coming here, that they looked up and saw me and saw this great light around me. This big, bright light around me. Oh, okay. But then when they met the liar one time, there was another light that came, but it wasn't right. It was just a light. And so he began to talk to me, what is going on in this battle between the gods? Because these people wanted to worship the God that they believed in, thought he was the healer. The enemy comes as an agent of light for a moment, but he isn't God. Okay? And so the Lord said, if they want to have faith to see things move, first they got to know who I am and then who they are. Who are you? So, you know, I, I'm thinking maybe I can get a hold of Steven Spielberg. I'm not sure that we can make a movie and do some fantastic special effects. But this is, you ready for this? This is what the angels are watching right now. If you got Jesus, there's light emitting around you. So if we could just for a moment look in this room, there's light coming out of you because of Christ in you. You see? And it says that darkness has no light in it. 
And so there's a world out there that we want changed, but until you know your light and walk as light, they can't see the difference between their light, which is a false light, which tells them that they're okay, but they're not. They have received a false light that makes them believe in a God like Zeus. So they worship that. And so there's a point that we have to gain in our understanding of God and ourselves and what we are to walk in. I have seen a lot of miracles in the ministry God has allowed me to have. I remember years ago, we took a ministry team down to Belize to do children's ministry in the, in, in the poor. And, and we all, vacation Bible school, we did family foundation down there. And I was asked to preach in this church. And... Um, they were supposed to film me, and they turned the camera off. I'm not saying who did it, but um, and I was preaching about this revelation of the Spirit in the baptism of the Spirit, that when the Spirit came upon the apostles, Peter and all of them, they knew it was Jesus' Spirit because they had been so close to Jesus in the natural. They recognized His Spirit. And I've shared this before with Jackie and, and another young girl that they could lean against each other without knowing who was there because they were so close emotionally they could know, well, that's my friend because they were connected spirit to spirit. And it was kind of a wild time. I took my kilt with me, God told me to, and I dressed up in my kilt that night into a church that was a little blown away, didn't understand why I dressed that way. I told him because I wanted to give you my best from my nation to your nation. And then I preached Acts and the baptism and the power of God to heal. And this woman needed healing. She was a big woman. She was taller than I was. And she was, my shoulders busted. And I needed healed. I go, okay. And so I had a team that was supposed to help me and intercede. Yeah. And, and so when I went to pray for the woman, she hit the floor. But she didn't hit the floor normal fallout. She landed on her elbow. Okay? And the bad shoulder. And the next thing I started to pray, I said, I command that darkness to come off your body. And she began to spin on the elbow, completely not touching the ground except for her elbow. Yeah, that's what the team said. Oh, my. So I look. They all backed away, hit, hugged the wall because they were scared as this woman is spinning. On the, I'm not exaggerating. This fast. And I'm going, get out of her. Heal her body, Lord. And then I look at my ministry team, and they're stuck against the wall going, this is freaking us out. Kind of. She got up, and her arm was totally healed. Had nothing to do with me, because I didn't know. No way would you even imagine God doing a healing with someone's elbow on the floor spinning. But I want to teach you something. When God speak, he was speaking to me about the witchcraft that was over her life, and I didn't know what it was. And when it got broke off, and when you're in Belize, there's a lot of witchcraft, and a lot of stuff going on, and it was all broken, and so the Lord was spinning that stuff out of her, and she gets uphill. Huh? Then she got up and danced. I'm telling you, she danced. See, and so everybody goes, well, that has to happen every time. No, it won't. No, it won't. It won't happen. And I've had many people I prayed for. You know how many, a whole year I prayed for my wife when her discs were bad and she needed surgery? Every day. Every day. Every day. And she can't move. And pain on a scale of 1 to 10 to 10. You know what the enemy said? Where's your faith? You're not doing it right. 
I come and pray for people at church and they get healed. All the time, right in front of them. This whole message is, are you connected to God or are you connected to what you want? That's the battle. It doesn't matter what you get. He's God. So when my son had passed, the next day I'm asking God, why did Joshua die? He told me why. I felt such grief, such pain like I've never felt. And he said, now you know how I felt when my son died. Will you give me your son as I gave me yours? And I go, no, I want my son back. And you know what he said to me? But I am God. That's it. I'm God. I didn't like that. But can I give you a clue? There's nothing we can do to remove him. It's God. We may not like how he does it. We may not like what he does. We may not like the fullness of how it works out. But either he is or he isn't. And if he is, then we put our faith in him. Could you put up Matthew 17, please? Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter and James and John and his brother and lived up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, his clothes as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. The transfiguration. He gave us in Scripture what we will be like. We will be like him in the resurrection. We'll be full of light, transformed, transfigured, full of light. But you ready? You are now. You have light in you now. You don't have the fullness of the transfiguration, but I'm thinking we could have a lot more. A lot more. First, you've got to repent for the things you put to other gods. This city paints their gods on the walls of our businesses. It makes me like a Scotsman. If I had my director right now, I know what I would do. Put on the battle bond, paint my face, and let's go. You bow before my God. But see, they will when you walk with your God. When you give up all your stuff and quit trying to figure out how to become religious rather than know who God is. So he was light. He transfigured in front of Peter, James, and John. And basically he was showing, this is what I was like before I came. This is what I'll be like after my resurrection. This is what I am. And so he, he gives us examples of where we're headed and what he wants for us. He wants you to walk in this brilliant light. I mean, I know we got it. But we've got to have faith that we got it. We have to trust that we got it. We have the conviction we got it. We have to rely on our trustworthiness that that's who we are now. When you're born again, you become light. And the enemy spends all his time trying to keep you in your past history, in your past failures, and everything it might have been, but rather than what you are. I remember years ago when we were doing Tuesday night over at First Church of God in their spare building there, and this girl brought her brother down from Reno who had a cancerous tumor right here in his brain. Went and I laid my hands on him. I said, be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. He had his head back began to shake and blood and stuff come pouring out. And the tumor was gone. Why do I give you testimonies? Because he's able to build faith. And then second, hear God. Hear God. That, why did that woman bring him? Because she was in desperate need that her brother didn't know Jesus and she wanted him saved because she was afraid he was going to die and go to hell. Her main focus wasn't healing as much as it was that he would meet God. He met God. 
So the world, by the way, will whatever happens with God, try to put it to another God. I know people who've had demonic things removed off of them and they never use drugs and alcohol again. And then when they give their testimony, the worldly people will say, well, you know, they just, something just happened and it shifted. And no, it wasn't God. It wasn't God. See, that's like Zeus. The world will not accept what our God does. I'm telling you that right now. The world will not accept it. The issue is not for them to accept it. It's for us to believe it. And when we believe it, and things begin to happen, and when they want to argue, they can argue all they want. But the person who's healed doesn't care. The person who's set free doesn't care from their demons. They don't care. They don't care what the world says. I don't use it anymore. I don't care what you say. They, they, they can tell me that, well, when you got prayer, Pastor John, when you, were unsa when you just gotten saved by two or three months, that you got delivered all drugs and alcohol. That wasn't real. I mean, you just decided to quit. That's what they would tell you. The world would say. He did in a moment. Sometimes he does it over time. But he does it. He does it. And the world wants to say, well, I don't know. Because they're like these people who said, oh, it's Zeus did it. You must be a god, Paul. You must be a god, Barnabas. No! I know the god who does it. See? So what has the church done? We go to, we go to pastors that have anointed for healing, so everybody's going to be healed. And, and then we go to a pastor who's anointed for prophetic to get a prophetic word. And, and we go to another pastor who's, who's called to do deliverance. And, and we do all these things rather than coming to the God who does it all. It's the God who does it all. He transformed right there for Peter, James, and John to know, this is how I'm going to be, guys. And now, if you went on read the passage, that's when the voice come out of the cloud and goes, um, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. I mean, I, it would be really cool right now. Really cool right now if all of a sudden... Listen to him. He's one of my children. Listen to him. They even had that experience and backed away. Because see, there's a battle. How's that battle function? Why don't you put up Hebrews, please? This is a scripture I wrestled with for years and years and years. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews 11.6. Well, you know what we usually do? We stop at the comma. We have to have faith to please God. Okay? That's true. But after the comma, what it says? Faith to be healed? Nope. Faith to believe you can be delivered? Nope. What faith is? That he is. And so what has happened in Christian faith, we've got these things. Well, I'll tell you what, you just put that on that refrigerator and you slap that thing every day and you're going to get that boat, you're going to get that fishing boat you've been wanting, you're going to get that second house, you're going to get this thing, your kids are going to get a free education and you just keep slapping it. And I, I believe by faith I'm going to get it because all things are possible with God. And then 15 years later, they're not walking with God because they never got the boat, never got this, never got that. And they're going, oh my God, where, where is God? He's not true to the scripture. And they didn't get the part that he is God. He's just God. See, we, we look at God for what we get rather than that he is God. He's just God. My prayer for you is that we would have this place rocking one day, totally rocking. Some of the older people would lead the younger people and know how to rock. I'm serious. They don't know how to rock. We develop rock and roll. Okay? I mean, my goodness. I don't know what you guys listen to now, but it ain't rock and roll. Let the rock roll, people. Let me ask you. If you're saved, what would happen if you finally 
God took you to heaven, showed you eternity, showed you your house, showed you what you got in your salvation, what would it be like for you? Would, would, would it change maybe how you walk with God? Would it change maybe how you worship God? Would it mean to put things in a different order in your life? So if you're saved here, we should have had this place whistling with rock and rolling for Jesus. You know why? Because I got eternal life. I was bound for hell and didn't know it. I was going to spend eternity from all my family who had gone before me, my son, and everything if I hadn't gotten saved. And after we get saved, then we go, okay, God, why won't you heal me? Why won't you give me a better job? Why won't you do this? Why won't you do that? Why won't you do this? And he's up there going, I'm God. Why are you questioning me? I made you. Why are you questioning me? I'm God. Why did I have to have my tongue cut out at 13 months? Where's my God? Do you know how many people prophesied over me that I'd have a new tongue and I'd have all this ability that my speech would improve and everything? And I first got saved and they saw the scars on my neck and I had all these false prophets come up and lay hands on me. Oh, God's going to give you a new tongue. God's going to do this. And God's going to give you a new mouth and you're going to be able to do this. It never happened. But then I go to the doctor and they say, you don't have a tongue, but you can talk. <laughs> if you listened to me talk when I was 17, you wouldn't recognize the voice I have now. Yeah, I, I really struggle with the Old Testament names. I'm going to tell you that right now. And because I couldn't pronounce words, because I have to hear them to pronounce them because my tongue won't move. That's why I imitate words. If I hear it, then I can do a better job of pronunciation. But all these people said, this so I would have faith, right? Faith. And when, when you have a new tongue, it will bring all this great glory to God. The greater glory is that he allows me to speak without one. <laughs> Amen. So my mom, who knew how I spoke, knew me better than anybody in this room, came up many, many, many years ago, unannounced, and came to church when I was an associate pastor at the Vineyard, and I was preaching that Sunday. And as I'm preaching, she's back to the back of the church crying and weeping because she couldn't believe how I spoke because the healer had come not in the ways that man predicted but in the way he wanted it our healing isn't for our glory it's for his and the longer we try to take his glory we won't see none of it none of it so, it's impossible to please God without faith that he is. So everything structures on the conviction, on the confidence, on the trust, and on the belief that he is God. And if he's God, he made heaven and earth. He's God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's a God who put the trees where he put them. He's a God who built the mountains where he did. He's a God who does everything. He's a God who made the ocean and put everything in it. He's that big of God. And when we think of how big he is, a little healing that we desire is nothing for him beyond the fact that we just need to know he is. And there's, there's this battle out there of the enemy trying to stand in the way all the times of that he is. 
There's a cosmic war going on, people. Cosmic. Unbelievable. You shall be thankful. You don't have to experience what I experience in that battle. Put up Isaiah, please. This is how the battle fights. You ready? How are you? How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. <laughs> how you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations, for you have said in your heart, I, here it comes, will ascend to the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High God. There's the battle right there. Right there. Isaiah the prophet is telling us that I will is the fight over our lives. And when Paul and Barnabas released a healing from the God of heaven, they went to worship the God of darkness. They called him Zeus. They could have called him Peter, whatever. That was the battle. The battle we have is a man in heaven, it sits in the second heaven, a spirit who says, I will be like God. And you will worship me on the farthest side of the north. And I will be lifted up above the stars. I will do all these things. Now we could go on and find out what's going to fully happen to him. But that's the battle. And don't ever forget, as you come to know Jesus Christ as Savior, there's one assigned to destroy you. Because you are supposed to be the light that shows the world who Christ is. You're the light. He's the dark one. And so people who worship him, they bow. And you know how you worship him when you don't obey God. When you say, oh, you know what, ah. I know it's tough to come to church on Sunday. I know it is. Why does he call us out to church? Why does God say, come out of your home and come to church? Because he wants you to suffer without enough sleep? Why? Because there's a cosmic picture working right now. And there's how many thousands in this city who would claim Jesus Christ as their Lord who are serving the other God because they won't come and worship the Most High. What's happened? Oh, I know. Let's just let soccer for the kids be on Sunday. I know, let it be Little League, let it be basketball. Let's do everything to take away the worship of the Most High God. That's what it's about. You can come religiously in church, get nothing, or you can come to church and worship He is. And get it all. There is this picture in heaven. And we have it. Pastor Mike and I and Pastor Paul had a good prayer time this week. My pastor. It was good. God came. Hmm. So, tell me what this means. This isn't in Scripture, so, Terry, I'm not going to make you look it up, okay? I'm going to give it to him. It's in Ephesians. Okay. You're a spiritual being. Everybody agree? You're born again? You have the Spirit of God. You agree? Okay. Hmm. To me, Ephesians chapter 3, to me, who am less than the least of the saints, the grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unreachable searches of Christ 
and to make see what is the fellowship of the mystery which is beginning of the ages have been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. He's talking about your salvation. It was a mystery. The devil didn't know it was coming. Okay? He didn't know. He didn't know about grace because he got none when he sinned. So Paul's going, guess what, guys? It's a mystery. It was hidden from him. Your salvation moment was hidden from him. The resurrection of Christ was hidden from him. And you know why? Here it is. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God may be known by the church. Oh, somebody say the church. No, 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 I can't hear you. The church. Yes, the church. To who? The principalities and powers in heavenly places. Dad, got me? You want to whoop on that devil? You come worship that he is. And when you do, you make known in the cosmos that we are the people of God and he is our God and we don't bow before anybody else. Nobody. We make known. You get that? We make known. So what do you make known? Well, listen. God, I'm tired. Totally, God. It's been a tough week. I've had to work 10, 12 hours. My dad won't get me off the roof. He, he's killing me. He's killing me. You know, I mean, even though it's 50 degrees out and I'm not sweating, I'm just crying. Oh, I won't get up. God, don't you love me? You know I love you. Let me sleep till 10. <laughs> He gives you six days so you can eat and the seventh is for him. The manifold wisdom is in us. You are the light to show darkness who he is. Who he is. So when you're saved and you raise your hands in the home of his house, you're looking at that devil and said, you had me, but now you don't. Now I'm free. I can worship the Most High God. I will not bow my knee to the one who says I will be. He will be. So he plays a big game on humanity. Love God and do as you please. What? Oh, that's, excuse me. We need to put that up. That's American Christianity. Love God and do as you please. It's okay. He understands. Don't say that. Because when you say God understands, He understands that He is. And you don't know your call to give Him glory. You don't know that you are the light that will disperse the darkness in your city, in your families. Now, I'm, I'm going way back, okay? Could you put up that last... Scripture, please, Terry. Exodus? Here we go. All right. And God, everybody say God, God. spoke all these words. Mm -mm. Hey, Moses got this right from the God himself. It was so important to God, Moses didn't write it down. God wrote it down on a stone tablet. You get that stone tablet? It couldn't be destroyed like a rock on the tablet. I am the Lord your God. Hmm. Who brought you out of the land of Egypt? Who brought you out of your sin and failure? Out of the house of bondage. Anybody have any bondage removed in this house? Can you say amen? amen? Come on! You're tiring me out. So he's brought you out of your Egypt. He's brought you out of your bondage. And then he has this neat little phrase. You shall have no other gods before me. Oh, oh, here we go. You know, this is the first one of all those commandments. Y'all know that, right? We don't need to go past number one. The problem is we've gone past the number one and we want everybody else to get, receive the healing. The deliverances. You know, all that blessing of God. 
you shall have no other gods, small g. No other. None. Period. Zilch. Nada. Whatever language you want to speak in. You shall make for yourself no carved image, a likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Quit worshiping everything that I make. It's a gift to you. It's a gift to us. You know, we got people who are fighting to save whales. Praise God, save the whales. But they're worshiping the whale. You know what I mean? For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Uh oh. Doggone him. He's jealous. Hmm. Visiting the Nicola here. Uh oh, no, we don't want to go any farther than this. Why don't we just stop there? Because this next part gets kind of, kind of scary for us. Okay, so let's, why don't we take a vote? And ask God to remove some of this because this is a hard part to swallow. But I don't think we can erase it, can we? Because this is number one. Vision the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. You want your kids in church? You want your families restored? Knock it off. Repent. He just laid it out there. Because I'm going to give mercy to a thousand generations. Now, yeah, the children are not responsible for your stupidity. Are you ready? It opens the door that they might gain it. Stupidity. It opens the door that the darkness now might have access to whisper in their ear and say, it was good enough for dad and mom, why don't you do it too? That's all it is. And then we get upset. I just don't understand. My kids won't listen to me about God. Well, are you the light you're supposed to be? Are you going after God like he says to come after God, that he is? The neat thing is Jesus Christ says, guess what? If this makes any sense, I'm here to wash you and get you upright. I'm here to give you grace and mercy and love so we break that bondage, we break that generational curse, and we move on to the right way of living. That you follow the God of heaven that he is. That you lay your life down in love and you serve him out of love, not out of obligation, but out of the freedom of what he set you free in. That you would know that he is your God. That phrase has been rumbling in my heart for so many years now, the last few years, that when I can sit there and go, you're my God. My God. Think for a moment. My God. My God. That's it. He's my God. And, and my God made heaven and earth. The devil made nothing. My God, create some fish I'm going to eat tonight for dinner. My God. The devil didn't make that. The devil made nothing good. But everything God made was good. And he said, you're my kids. I want to give it to you. Because I'm your God. You, what, what do you want? Well, I'm a jealous guy. I don't like the fact you hang out with other people. I hate that you're cheating on me. 
And when you read all the Old Testament, it always says over and over again that he would tell Israel, you're committing adultery on me. You're cheating on me, Israel. You're cheating on me. You're going after foreign gods. And he gave them four or five hundred years to get their act together from prophet upon prophet. And they go, oh, well, we're okay. That's okay. It's all right. We'll still. And they finally start offering their babies and sacrifices to Moloch. Finally, God said, okay, I warned you. Now I got to take you and discipline you. Guess where? You're going to Babylon. But you're only going to be there 70 years until you get your head together. And then you can come back. I'll bring you back. I'll even move an unrighteous king to release you. Because I'm God of heaven and earth. And I'll bring you back, Israel. And I'll bring you back to Israel. And you'll rebuild the, the temple. And you're going to do all these things because i got a son coming. And I want you to be an example to the whole world that I'm God. Do you ever think why the world doesn't know he's God? Remember Ephesians? We're to make known the manifold wisdom of our salvation. And he just said, I'm a jealous God. Put me first. And everything else will be okay. And so how did it work when they asked Jesus? Well, hey, Jesus, what, what, what commandment is greatest? Well, I love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind, and then love your neighbor as yourself. See, he doesn't make it real complicated. He really does. We complicate, we complicate it. it. Okay? okay? If you knew how much light is in you that isn't shining, you would be stunned. If you knew how much grace must be poured over you today, you would be stunned to know. Maybe he might even heal someone today. I don't know. We'll ask. Got my oil. I don't know. Maybe, maybe he'll take that thing off of you that, it, it, that you get to live in a city and a county that is the very emphasis of Laodicea in the whole country. That's what I believe. I mean, why in the devil name this city Laodicea? Because God didn't name it. Captain Reed named it. And what man who would know about Laodicea want to name a city after it? He must have been a bad guy. He's a bad guy. I wonder. Maybe I need some deliverance. What if the devil knew what this place was meant to be? So he brings a man here and names it Laodicea and releases it into the ground, into the spirit realm. And all the manifold principalities and powers over this area says, if we can control what God meant for good here, it will hold a state in bondage. What if it wants to hold us in bondage? What if you sitting here today is the answer to the breaking of the bondage? That you worship him, that he is. That he's above this city. He's in the third heaven. He has complete control over the second but he's waiting for the manifestation of his church to show the glory that he is. I was walking in sin and decadence and bondage, addiction. I had no idea that before the foundation of the world, 
before I was even born or made that I was called to be a preacher. I had no idea that I would be casting demons out of people and they would come from all over the world to get set free. I had no idea. I didn't sit down and go, okay, I got saved, so this is my plan, God. You make me a preacher, and I'll do deliverance, and I'll do healing, and I'll do these things. I had no idea. And I was stupid enough just to let God do it sometimes. Because I didn't know no better. Because I hadn't been trained in the church how to think. Now, I'm not putting down the church. I'm just telling you, I had no idea. So I, I knew nothing. I... I I read the Bible at 19, but that was late great planet Earth, and I thought he was coming back, and I was stoned when I did it. Okay, so I really wasn't getting much, okay? So I just started reading it. I just started reading it, and, 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 and I, I, I go, oh, he heals. Okay, the book says he heals. Uh, the book says that he made my hands clean, and I can raise them to him. I read that one day. And so I did that in church, and I told him to put my hands down. Oh, and, and then I kept reading. I'm going, but, and then I met a man named Dr. Wright. And if you were here on Sunday night prayer, you'd have heard how him and I talked to each other. It's a great Sunday night prayer. It's powerful. It shook hell. It shook hell. Because him and I would sit there, and, and he, he has a tendency to, to level on me. I mean, you guys, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sissy. How I treat you. Yeah, I have no idea. He was here. And he's doing this from my face. When will you believe? You can't get away from that. Because we took and read the book. And we didn't agree until God told us what to agree and believe. Okay? Well, how do you... Hold, hold it here. How do you believe this when it says this, Pastor? He said, but you don't understand. I said, no, but I'm just reading it as what it says. I mean, I, I'm stupid. I don't know what Greek is. I don't know what Hebrew is. But it says here that he'll do this. And, and it doesn't say he stopped. Yeah. And show me where it stopped, because I just want to be right with God. And you know why we got along? Because I believe he is God, and so is Pastor Paul. And we both walked in not knowing what we should know, but want God to tell us what we needed to know. And so we still to this day go at it. To this day, last week we went at it, and I used the wrong word, but, and man, he was in me, he was chopping on my head. I don't care what you think, what does God promise? What happened to the sensationist I met 25 years ago? It's my fault. <laughs> it's my fault. Dad, I brought him to my side and he beat me up with it. <laughs> I love the man. Okay, I love him. <laughs> it's true. He's now more charismatic than I am. He won't admit it. Now, I still think he's praying in tongues under his breath. I'm not. Uh, yeah. But you know what he told me? The day I pray in tongues, I'll never know it. That's how stubborn he is. He won't give me one up. I mean, that's bad, isn't it? I'm waiting for that day when glory fills this house because you all know who you are in God and you all know who you are in light and all of you are worshiping God like you're supposed to and the manifold wisdom of God begins to manifest in Zion Christian Ministries and the glory begins to fill the house and Dr. Wright walks in, gets Holy Ghost and prays in tongues. And all of you, too. <laughs> he is. The battle is that he won't believe he is. That's all it is. 
hate to break the sad news to you. They can paint all they want on every building in the city. It don't change our God. It just lets them know who they are. Praise God. They're devils. Don't say that on here. Go on here. No, they're devils. They're worshiping the devil. Sorry. They had to tell the whole city leadership that they weren't worshiping the devil. They did in the meeting. They brought all the business people together and said, guess what? Oh, there's this rumor going around that that painting is, is worshiping the devil. And they said, no, we're not worshiping the devil. And everybody laughed. And so when everybody laughed, every demon on their men entered into those business people. But he is our God. He is our healer. He is our deliverer. He's maker of heaven and earth. He wants to make you and shine like light. He wants this light in you to begin to come out. I, I, in other words, we're going to... Yes, we're going to do that, Jesus. We're going to have a charismatic moment. I am the Lord God, he said to Moses. And he didn't trust Moses to write it down. He wrote it down. I'm God. You'll have no other gods before you. No boyfriend, no husband, no child, nothing but me. Then I'll give you the husband, I'll give you the wife, I'll give you your children, I'll give you everything I want to give you, as long as you know that I am your God. Because in the end, he's coming back to tell the whole world what? I'm God. Huh? <laughs> what a day. Oh my goodness. They'll be hiding in rocks, it says. Because they'll still be angry because they don't want the God. Who tells them to stop doing what they're doing? That's the battle over you. We had a very insightful prayer time. Someone gives us prophetic words and we don't know what they mean. And um, there were two words. And if I can remember right, be. Fool? What? Be father. Buffoon. Buffoon and bombardment. Now, you take some guys in the room and give you a prophetic word, buffoon and bombardment. And that's all you got. That's it. Huh? That's what we're supposed to do. And I heard it. I heard it. Now, it may be just my interpretation from God, but I heard it. Who's the biggest buffoon in the world? Come on, tell me about it. He's a buffoon because he thought he could become what? Like God. Buffoon. A total buffoon. Come on, he's a buffoon. So we're praying, I'm praying in time. What does it mean? He goes, who's the biggest buffoon? I go, the devil. Uh-oh. Who's the little buffoons? Who listen to him and believe him? Okay, that's what I heard. Then came bombardment. What's bombardment? What's bombardment? He goes, I'm about ready to bombard that buffoon and set my people free. I'm about to bring bombardment upon that guy who's held my people in bondage, who've held my church without loving me, who's held me up and not let me be who I am. I'm going to bombard that buffoon. He's a fool. So, shall we try an experiment just with Jesus for a second? Hey, Brian, come here. Okay. So, would you believe you have light in you? Would you believe at times the devil tries to come along and cover it up? Does he come and bring oppression over you and all kinds of things? And he kind of wraps you up where you can't see, right? So what would happen, Brian, if the power of God begins to come and he takes all that work and takes it off of you and you're free? And light! 
Don't steal any of it, Brandon. <laughs> and then you can shine in light. Then you can shine in the light. Why? <laughs> <laughs> he answered his prayer. Well, shoot, you're not covered up anymore. You're free. That's what goes on. Okay? Don't give me that. Hey, I saved you. The guy that used the kitchen dropped you on the floor. What I'm trying to show you is it's a veil over you. It's a veil of darkness that doesn't want you to see how big God is. I know my wife loves the Lord. She puts up with me. But what if there's part of her veil to the fullness of who she really is? And the fullness that God wants her to be. Oh, yeah. And then God comes along and says, Daughter, I love you and I unveil you now in Jesus' name. And then he says, Now shine, daughter. Shine. Shine. Shine in the light. Fire. <laughs> Don't drop my wife, Brandon. I know, isn't that good? There's so much power there, it makes my hair grow. Is that good? That's good. Praise God. That's praise God. And you say, now, Pastor, this is a little bit weird. Hey, you, I could be Smith Wigglework and kick you off the stage. Y'all know that story, right? Yeah, the baby was all twisted and deformed, and the baby sat on the stage, and Smith waves will work, here's a word from the Lord, kick that baby and it'll be healed. He just takes that baby and kicks it right up in the air. And as the baby's up in the air, people are rushing the stage to beat him up. And next thing you know, the arms are straightened out, the legs are straightened out, and the baby is totally healed. Sometimes you have to obey God. Woo, there's fire on my wife. Praise God. <laughs> you okay? Is it hot? So there's fire here. She's got fire all over. Praise God. Me not stupid. I made her second because sometimes she gets lost in the mix-up. No way. I want her to get it. You know what I'm saying? So, what are you saying, Pastor? Is it about this? Not even. This is cool. You know how happy this can make my home? Honey, I see a flame of fire coming out of the top of your head. Oh my God. Shoo, 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 shoo. Oh my God. Well, it's about God said to me while I grabbed it. He said, they got a veil over them because they live in Red Bluff and Tehama County. There's a darkness that's doing this all the time over you. Just so you won't have the fire. So that you'll feel like you're okay, but not totally okay. That you're, you're going after God, but you're not going after the fire. And, and he just, just a little bit to keep you from burning hot. 
Because he knows once you burn hot, he can't put out the fire. <laughs> um, you okay, brother? <laughs> oh, my stomach hurts. <laughs> my abs. <laughs> hey, Jan, come here. Come on. Hey, that's old people need it, man. I mean, we've been fighting this battle a long time. Hi, Jan. I am. I'm a kind man. Come, Holy Spirit! Take that veil! Whoa! Take it off of her now in Jesus' name. Ah! Oh, man, she got hot fast. That's a quick burn. Hey, Kim, come here. I'm waiting for you guys to become rowdy and quit waiting to be called upon, but I'm waiting. God says, let them see what's going to happen. Maybe they'll come without me being invited. But every bit of it, Lord. The war oh, oh, Lord, she's in business with her husband, and that business world wants to submit to that veil and wants to submit to it, so everything... Now fire come and remove it off my wife. Your wife. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh my God. 